So, our next speaker is Jenny Murray. Um, she's given us, and we know Jenny very well, but she's given us some uh, spiel about herself as well. So, she's a Shetlander with a passion for local history and archaeology. And very importantly, she's the curator of collections <coughs> at Shetland Museum. And she's responsible for the archaeological collection. And she did her BA with uh, honours in cultural studies with the UHI, University of the Highlands and Islands, and she did her MLIT in Orkney and Shetland studies uh, with us at the Centre for Nordic Studies. And she's currently undertaking an MPhil with St Andrews University. Um, and eventually, she'll be doing a PhD with us. <laughs> if we <were> <laughs> so, um, today she's going to uh, take us back into, into folklore. Um, and I've heard a little bit of this before, and uh, it's very enjoyable. So, Jen. Thank you. Um, my papers change the bits as I put in my abstracts, as you know, I always know, it grows in time. And anybody that's heard me speaking before will be glad to hear I'm not speaking about Iron Age plugs today, so at least the audience may stay awake um, for a wee while anyway. And I'd like to thank the um, Centre for Nordic Studies for organising this conference because it gives us such a great chance to meet together and discuss what we do. Um, as a curator, work, my working life is spent among Shetland's material culture, and it's a privilege to do so. At the museum store, me and Laurie is surrounded with thousands of artefacts, but each and every one of those inanimate objects has a story to tell, and it's that story that brings them alive. Take, for example, this Norse weight in the shape of a horse. We know it's a weight, but from its context where it was discovered, we know a far more interesting story now than that just of a weight, and you'll see more of this small horse later. It's an important part of our work at the museum to gather as much information about our collection as possible, and that leads me to the donors, and my favourite part of my work is meeting and chatting with the people and recording their stories. An oral testimony can give a deep insight into the history of the people involved, and it is imperative that we gather this information for others to appreciate in the future. And this brings me to the first family that you've asked me since. That's a good old Norse name, isn't it? Um, there's four generations. Eric is the man that you'll hear about. He's a lovely man that we work with at the museum. Fantastic with his hands. And this is his mum in the third man along. This is four generations, and I got some wonderful lore from her about the craft and life, which I don't have time to tell you today. And I also need to thank the Mansons, you'll hear about them, and we've had some fine times in the book the night. There are three generations spanning back to the 1900s, and what memories they have to share about times past. Since the coming of the North Sea to our shores in the 70s, and the advancement of technology, much has changed in Shetland society. Craft and her fishing are no longer the mainstay of the island's economy, and with its decline, uh, the islands have witnessed a significant change in the traditional way of life, a primeval relationship between the people and their environment with a sustained life in Shetland over millennia. Deeply rooted within these ancient seasonal rhythms of life is a vocabulary of wisdom, customs and rituals that were passionately adhered to, essential for the sa safekeeping of the folk who used them, as Terry's been speaking about earlier. The waning of traditional life saw the inevitable decrease in language associated with crafting and fishing. And some of these are lexicons now housed in dictionaries instead of buyers and barns. Maturing generations may hold dear the lore of their forefathers, but it appears that the younger generations are becoming further removed from the old wise and have little um, need for such language or superstition. And likewise, the role of the church has seen its grip weaken as advancing science offers alternative philosophies, changing the dynamics of life's moral codes. My paper will investigate some of the old customs and beliefs surrounding the crafting and fishing here in Shetland, and we will see through the voices of the Erasmusans and the Mansons that these customs are diluting, but not as fast as you think. Born in uh, 1928, Mrs. Erasmus was brought up in a fold of a crafting community on the west side of Shetland. Their house, Kirkhus and Twark, was adjacent to the village kit, ensuring a low pro profile was kept on the Sabbath. She told me no crafting work was done on the Sundays. 
The Sunday thing was faithfully keep it, she said. We'd pack them up your tarties for Sunday dinner. We had to do that the night before. And owing to superstition inherited from his father in Skell, this is the Erasmus and Schoos here, Eric still would never start a project or repair something on a Sunday because nothing but ill would come of it. Preferring instead to leave it till Monday. So thankfully what to Monday till Friday at the museum. <laughs> Fishing was also banned on the Sabbath. Um, but Eric explained his family could go out on the boat just for pleasure. But he said, I don't think we ever weeded the dorm on a Sunday. And although not an overtly religious man, Eric still adheres to this tradition today, but says his son Robert, who's in his early 30s now, would hove a dog while the side of a boat on Sunday just nay bother. This dilution of belief is also reflected in the hallowed language of fishermen still used by Eric when off on his boat. The words captain, minister, are never uttered, and instead Eric still uses footic and upstander. And in comparison, <coughs> Robert would not worry about these superstitions and may say them and voice them just to tease his dad when they're off in the boat. Like all fishing communities, the island's older generation were adept at reading the weather, and certain things were done at certain times depending on the sun and the moon and how the tide was running. When off in the boat, Eric explains that he would never turn the boat against the sun. He would aim turn with the sun, he says, so when you come around with the sun, the tiller wire is called weather gates, and you never get weather gates. That's just not allowed. And Laurie, being the daughter of a fisherman, when I turn the car the wrong way, she gets up and laughs. Go the wrong way, she'll say. <laughs> Steeped in tradition, Eric relates other superstitions that still hold fast in the Erasmus' family. Like his dad and his granddad before him, Eric will spit into the mouth of the first fish that he lands on his boat, ensuring luck for the, a good luck for the catch. And reminiscing about past fishing trips, he recounts being warned by his grand uncle Jimmy Erasmussen, seen here, um, not to count the fish as you tack them in. Although I'm not sure what Uncle Jimmy is fishing for here in this trip. <laughs> <laughs> when the first one Fish, fish was landed, the older men would say that there was life to the lung, and the other fish that followed were white upon white, and Eric still doesn't count fish. But to use these forbidden words may bring bad luck to the boat, but equally, rituals could be performed to evoke good fishing, and by spitting in the fish's mouth, Eric is hopeful of a plentiful catch. Folklorist Ernest Marwick notes that if the fish were slow to take, it was pertinent to spit into the mouth and then send it back to the sea to encourage others. A retired fisherman from Scala, Bobby Fraser, related to me the ritual of wife by his dad when they were off fishing. Dad would go down into the engine room and take up a long rod with a bit of rag dipped in oil, and he'd light it and take it to the bow. And he would roar and make queer noises, putting away evil spirits, and then he would go down to the stern. And he said, I hope we will have some good luck now, and he dipped the rod in the water and put it back down to the engine room. Deep within the rhythms of traditional daily life, luck appears to have been a driving force and nothing was left to chance. Things were said and done to placate evil spirits and certain rituals were done to keep ill at bay, <coughs> and others in the hope of good fortune. Fishermen were particularly devoted to this law as their livelihood depended on a good catch and a safe return. Eric is uneasy about letting go of inherent superstitions, but as noted, as noted, his son Robert, who spent less time at sea with men so steeped in lower, that he had no worries about such rituals. And the language of the sea still used by Eric is an age-old tradition going back over generations. So let's have a look now and see what we can do to encourage luck and help keep fishermen safe. We move now on to the Manson family and their beliefs. Back in 1979, at the time of the age of 19, um, I managed to pass my driving test on my first attempt. Now this was achieved not because of my hours of practice or my driving abilities, but that my success that day was attributed to Mary Manson. I later found out that my future mother-in-law 
had laid an armus on her mum, Mary, that if I pra- passed my driving test, she would buy her a bottle of sherry. <laughs> In the Shetland Dictionary, Johnny Graham describes an armus as a gift promised in the hope that a wish will be granted to the donor. The donor is said to lay on an armus, and if the wish is granted, the person who is presumed to have brought the luck is said to have won the armus. This gift of luck was surely a truly win-win situation as I could now drive and marry the bottom of sherry. <laughs> and my mother-in-law was absolutely sure that she had played a part that day. So what is the history of arms gifts? An article published in 1926 by John Nicholson under the title The Armas Kirk. Um, and Nicholson defines the defines the word arms as it derived from the old Norse word Ulmusa. Um, we'll com- there's two definitions of arms or charity, and you'll see the second one, imbecile person. That one's not mine, and um, we'll come back to that. Nicholson argues that the Shetland Amos did not mean arm, but was an offering laid on some deserving individual or object in the hope of appeasing the term of some important event. Jesse Saxby, one of Shetland's prolific folklorists and lover of all things Norse, proposed that laying on an armus dated to the patriarchal days. The author describes the promise of a gift in exchange for luck as the ancient Norse custom to vow a vow, and suggests that Shetlanders were practicing this tradition long before the Bible was in their hands. She also warns that if you did not pay up the armus, you would never succeed in winning another, and that if you ever uttered to anybody that you'd laid on an armus, the promise that the powers would never off honor your vow. So if we look back again at the old Norse word Ul Musa, we see its second definition as an imbecile person. There appears also to be a link here to the Shetland armus. We still hear folk in the islands today referring to someone who's unwell or poorly as a poor armus, and somebody as poor armus. This link to the sickly was picked up by earlier folklorists such as John Spence and William for Dice Clark. They collected old traditions and found that one that suggests that when fishermen left their house, it was considered a good omen if they happened to meet an imbecile, as, as they call it, or a person who was disabled from birth. These people, he writes, are called goods poor and were believed to be suitable armus bearers. For Dice Clark also notes that an armus could be about to a particular church rather than a person. She was a lovely day that the arms at St. Ninian's Isle. This practice is noted in Shetland folklore, but it's also recorded by visitors to the islands such as Reverend John Brand in 1700 and Samuel Hibbert in 1822. The custom was traditionally done by women to keep their minds safe while at sea, and also by men before they set off to the Greenland whaler. There are four Amos Kirks in Shetland, the Cross Kirk in Eshness, this chapel at, at St. Ninian's Island, Ladies, Our Ladies Kirk, also known as the Amos Kirk at Weasdale, and the one at the north of us at Clibberswick. Saxby notes that the Cross Kirk in Clibberswick was still in use in the 18th century and was a place of pilgrimage where women travelled to pray and laid coins to ensure the safe return of their mind at sea. Now, this is it wasn't such a good day when I went to Edgenard. Looking back to a small horse. This is not just a weight used by for trading by a Norse Shetlander, but a lucky charm placed within the walls of the Cross Kirk in Edgenard, maybe to bring luck to a fish to a fisherman or by a fisherman's wife in the hope that her husband will return home safely. Two coins of Eric III of Norway were also found at Aishna's Kirk in the walls, and this tradition of leaving votive offerings may have been practiced in Aishna's as early as the 14th century. This small steatite cup was also found close to the horse charm. The museum record documents a conversation with Kitty Sheen from Aishna's, who was born in 1904. She remembers her mother telling the story that in the 17th century, when folk travelled north from Hillswick, when coming in sight of the, gr- of the cross kirk, they would go down on their hands and knees and travel in that way until they were back out of sight of the kirk. Samuel Hibbert visited the Amos Kirk in Weasdale 
and report it. The man had placed his confidence in the offerings which he might make within the pale of the church, trusting that they would secure for him a happy voyage. He would drop money among the ruins and then would parade around the kirk on his bare knees. What a good one the bare knees here. Certainly, shipwrecked women would be in the similar position of wanting to do anything necessary to keep their men safe. And so by placing their trust in the Amos Kirk, this could go some way of really alleviating their anxiety. Hibbert also notes that the Kirk was frequented by women who pray in the hope of finding a man to suit them. So I think we're next singles night, we have to go to the Amos Kirk at Weasel, where we might get more luck if we go down on our knees. <laughs> And that near the pulpit of the church, a great quantity of all the different currencies of Shetland was found, from the gilder down to the stiver. Saxby notes that when the person dropped the coin into the church wall, they were heard to say, Good be with my, me and mine. Now, many of these um, old traditions that we've seen today do live on here in the islands. This is my sister in law a descendant of Mary Manson. Um, a few years ago, now Maribel just loves to dance, and this um, is Phil Taylor, he's a world champion, but she, for some reason she dis dislikes him. And so unbeknown to us, that she laid an amus on my son Lewis, who's seen here, with her, that Phil Taylor would lose in the final. And unbeknown to poor Phil Taylor that night, of the magic being created in Shetland, <laughs> he lost the dad, and he lost at the final. And a few days later, Lewis became the proud owner of a new PlayStation game, so he was delighted. <laughs> and it's fascinating to consider that we are now onto the fourth generation in these families, and that of Amos magic, and it's still being applied in the whole book today, something that's been done by Shetlanders for centuries. And can I just finish with a couple of stanzas from our um, Shetland's well-known court, Vagelin. <laughs> For one quote, four bearers were despicable with a cat when they were at the half, and they would never turn a boat against the sun when they get off. Mony a strange thing to up fox said, and mony a fair the eens they hate. For they believed in fishy knots and lucky cappy stains for by. And they would lay on armses for some good thing to come their way. They strayed for good with both in and out and tried to keep the Eloa. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Very interesting indeed. I'm sure there must be some questions or comments or very good. Very, I'm very interested to hear about the, the Amish. I've never, never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. uh, Iceland certainly has a similar sort of thing. It survives from the Catholic times, essentially. Yeah, it's and a particular Catholic church, <laughs> the people even when they're playing golf, if they get a hole in one or whatever, they're not giving money to the church. They don't stand by It's good. Then the word is out really okay. it's really used for. I think it, it's it, probably a bit closer to Catholic beliefs than anything, but it's lasted a long time. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. Because the minister in Asia is actually, um, he raised one of the ministers a long time ago, like, took the church down to try and stop them from doing it, because yeah. he saw it as a Catholic family. But, but they still went and did it. <laughs> that liminal place, isn't it, between good and evil and the inside and out? Um, it's, it's, mu it's potentially much older than um, just Catholic times. Um, it's, it's very similar in some respects to uh, the standard formula on Roman uh, altars mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, p uh, deservedly and, and uh, avowedly, you know, um, gave, to, gave to Jupiter or whatever, those kinds of inscriptions. Um, but also the secret uh, messages that are written on lead curse tablets where people have inscribed vows of what they'll do if they get something back or if they succeed in a particular <coughs> task and then cast into the waters at Bath, which is one of the biggest groups of, of uh, relatively new Latin inscriptions that's coming up in, in the classical world. Uh, is there a tradition of, of writing things down and posting them into church walls? Or no, that we've like pointed that? that might not have surprised, but no, that I'm aware of, no. Uh, so I said, that might disintegrate, I suppose we did it. <laughs> sure. 
Yeah, it really is. Fascinating. A couple of uh, points. Uh, on the Amos, did I hear you right that the Amos that your um, sister-in-law made was to, to the dad's prayer not to win? Yeah. That's new. I've always taken an Amos as being positive. I know. So, <laughs> I've never heard of negative Amos. You, you always say, I something positive is going to happen. So that's probably know. cultural dilution. I suppose, I suppose it was the end yeah. of you never, the, you never do an Amos wishing somebody any other. Yeah, that's right, I know. So I, I think that's maybe what my... This is Maribel's witching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. The, the other thing I was, I was going to add is that um, your story with Bobby Fraser's uh, burn on the thing with the engine room, I, mean, I, I remember as a, as a young boy uh, when the boats were at the Herring in Hamnevo, one particular boat uh, didn't get a good start and uh, one of the shareholders at the weekend went round the boat going with the sun with a piece of st straw burning it and it was called Burning the Witch. Uh, now I can remember that, I, I guess I'm quite old now, but that was within living memory. It wasn't done very often, it was done very quietly because I think there was a sense of almost embarrassment doing yeah. that ancient superstitious thing that they just weren't catching herring, all the other boats were. And to go it seemed to work. Yeah. Well, <laughs> because they got the herring 60s. the next week. That, that would be in the 1960s. Yeah, it was the 60s yeah. at August. Yeah. I was going to ask you, there's a, there's a tradition that the Pacific Islands have that there you, you speak to the stone or whatever it is you're offering. And I wonder if they, in this tradition you, there's a chant or some, how does the how does the, does the Amos know <laughs> what, what the person wants? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, um, I think they did, as uh, Jesse Sachs would know, that they did have a small, I don't know if it was a chant, but a saying that they did do. But again, that's kind of intense, but it's maybe been lost through in time. But, yeah, I mean, the, Actually, laying on an arm was, as you say, trying for the good things, you would never utter, because that would break that spell. Uh, what would you you'd think it? Yeah, you'd think it, but you'd never on. voice it mm -hmm. until afterwards, until somebody just pops along you with a bottle of sherry and says, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a uh, you know, success rate of 100%. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's very interesting. But I'd just say a couple of things to say. Um, we do we burn in the witch and we do a pretty bit of research into that. Um, and apparently it's still going on in the 1980s and they've not did a day because the, on the program Day Day's Catch they were doing exactly the same uh, ritual, which is very interesting. I think it's still going on today. Um, and apparently the idea comes with that the witch's hands was grabbing onto the boat and by burning the moon to a burn on the hands. Um, what I found interesting was somebody told me that they did this ritual after the minister had been on board. So, the no, connection between right. the minister and the witch head on is very, you know, it's, it's an interesting area. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I was thinking about was the, this idea of these early writers would speak about um, this continuation of popery and they'd say how terrible it was that they were carrying on with these Catholic traditions. But do you actually think that was what was going on? Was it really superstition that was taken on? You know, were they really had on these Catholic ideals or was it a mere kind of vernacular? belief system that was that was going on at the time. I think it's the belief system. Yeah. I think if you if you laid you put your money in the kick and your man goes off to Greenland and he comes home safely and everything's got good, you're you're going to be too frightened not to do it next year. Yeah. In case that if you don't do it and you just to come home. So it's that <coughs> belief that you've been able to in some way help appease evil and, and so it's I think it's just a, it's human nature to find it difficult to give things like that up. I mean, it's like the pagan and Christianity when they when they mix a lot of folk did both just to be sure. Yeah, I think it's misunderstood as Catholicism became by itself. They didn't really care what was going on, so they carried that. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing how it's still going on. I just did a talk the other night to the women's guild, and this wife just suddenly appeared to me. Well, you know, had Amos Lizzie. I said, no, but she's still alive, and she was born with one hand, and she's seemed to be really lucky, and all the balls of fishermen would lay an arms on her. <coughs> and another friend I was in for lunch with it said her, her uncle did that, and he had a, a, a puss that he kept coins in, made from a dried 
ram scrotum. <laughs> Not that it's going to be in It was a lucky ram. It's a big one. Because I can't see Victoria Beckham and that appeared by accident. He had special coins in it that, that was special to him. But you know, he would either be in a lucky coin or the scrotum box. So there you go. That's another letter for another day. <laughs> I think we'll leave it there. <laughs>